start uh, like this. I, I believe that uh, the government of uh, human mobility uh, is one of the, uh, the most important problems uh, facing our world, at least in this first half of the 21st century. Or, oh, in any case, it is uh, one of the, uh, uh, the major problems characterizing our global present. So that's the first thing I want to say, and I want to start with that assumption. The second uh, assumption I would like to share with you has to do with the fact that if one thing characterizes what I have just called the global present, it is the fact that the global present is a time of planetary entanglement. I call it uh, a time of planetary entanglement for various structural reasons. The most important of these reasons is that uh, worldwide the combination of fast capitalism as opposed to slow capitalism, fast capitalism, hyper-technological forms of warfare, and the saturation of the everyday by digital and computational technologies, these three things have led to a certain number of consequences which will only uh, escalate uh, as we move on. What are some of these consequences? The first has been, of course, the acceleration of speed. Speed has become, in and of itself, a key element for constituting power or redistributing it, uh, of course, uh, unequally and at a global scale. Any society or culture which today is uh, uh, deprived of that resource called speed uh, is in trouble. So that's the first consequence. There's a second consequence which has to do, of course, with the uh, intensification of connections, of the fact that uh, uh, today the uh, boundaries between here and there, those boundaries have, if not disappeared objectively, are at least under renewed pressure. And uh, the uh, crisis of the distinction between the here and the there, that crisis has uh, opened the door to us, all of us, being exposed to each other in ways we had never seen before. So, intensification of connections and their inextricability, which means that even if today we wanted to severe the connections, it wouldn't be possible. That is simply too late to severe the connections and go back to a space where we think we might want to live amongst ourselves. Or if we really want to severe the connections, then the price for doing so will be so colossal 
not only for those who are already the most vulnerable within the human race, but the moral price for the strongest amongst us will be such that uh, um, a very deep stigma will uh, accompany them for uh, a long time in history to come. So, the fact is that more than ever before at any other time in human history, as I was saying, we are exposed to each other almost directly, in any case, in ways that are less and less mediated. And this is a new condition. It was not always like that. Uh, it's, it's, it's new. So that's part of uh, some of the key features of our global present. But entanglement is not all that characterizes the now. These are also times when many are gradually coming to the uh, realization that uh, reason may well have reached its limits. Or in any case, it is a time when reason as a human faculty is once again on trial. It has been on trial uh, in the past, but it is on trial once again in entirely new ways and in an entirely uh, new uh, context. As you know, reason is a faculty we used to recognize in humans and in humans alone. In the um, Euro-American tradition, which we have all willingly or not become the inheritors, reason was always seen as the highest of all human faculties. The one uh, that opened the doors to knowledge, to virtue, to freedom, and hopefully to wisdom. And although unequally redistributed among them, it was the prerogative of humans alone, this so they believed. It distinguished them from other living species, and thanks to their alleged superior capacity to exercise this faculty, humans could claim to be exceptional. Today, reason is on trial in two ways. On the one hand, the logic of reason is morphing from within machines and computers and algorithms. And as a result, an inordinate amount of power is gradually being ceded to abstractions of all kinds. In fact, we have never lived uh, so much under the rule of abstractions. Old modes of reasoning are being challenged by new ones that originate through and within technology uh, in general, and digital technologies in particular, uh, as well as uh, through the, uh, the top-down models of uh, artificial intelligence. So what this means is that the human is no longer the privileged location of reason. Uh, or of calculation. The human brain is basically being downloaded into nano machines. And uh, the computational reproduction of reason has made it such that uh, uh, we now share it with uh, various other devices. On the other hand, so that's one way in which reason is 
under uh, pressure. It's put on trial by uh, the machines uh, that we have invented. The other way in which reason is on trial is through the fact that many are turning their back uh, to it in favor of uh, other faculties and other modes of expression and cognition. Uh, they are calling for a rehabilitation of affect and emotions, for instance, and in many of the ongoing political struggles of our times, passion is clearly trumping reason. And confronted with complex issues, feeling and acting with one's guts viscerally rather than reasoning is fast becoming the norm. And this applies, of course, to many areas of our common planetary life, including uh, people's movements. Uh, what uh, I'm saying uh, in short is that when it comes right now, worldwide, to questions of human mobility, reason is not the first faculty we appeal to. Um, numbers don't make it. It's uh, uh, as if uh, reason was on strike. So this is uh, another key feature of uh, our times. There are other features. For instance, there's a time too when we don't know any longer what to do with those who knock at our door. We don't want to know about those people who happen to be amongst us, who happen to be with us, but who are not, so to say, of us. So the very uh, idea of the human race, uh, of something we would have in common, uh, is being fragmented in front of our own eyes uh, by a logic of sissiparity, division, the subdivision of divisions, uh, uh, and uh, with, uh, in the background, the belief that we do not need these people, we don't want them to need us, we just want them out. Uh, and this urge to expel, to be without, rather than to be with, is, it seems to me, significant of the extent to which we want to cut any relation with them. So, so the times are for separation. Uh, the, the dream uh, of apartheid uh, is uh, driving a lot of uh, what is going on. Uh, we thought we defeated apartheid in South Africa only to see that in fact uh, it had a, a bright future uh, worldwide. Indeed, wherever we look, the drive is decisively towards contraction, it is towards containment, and it is towards enclosure. Now, what do I mean, you'll ask me, by enclosure, contraction, and containment? I think these three notions of enclosure, contraction, and containment refer to two key developments which have undergone a kind of uh, acceleration since the last quarter of the 20th century, a kind of uh, acceleration triggered by many different factors, uh, in particular by the uh, explosive nature of new technological inventions. One such development has been the erection worldwide of all kinds of walls and fortifications, uh, gates 
and enclaves. In other words, various practices of uh, partitioning space, of uh, offshoring and fencing of uh, wealth, of uh, splintering territories, of uh, breaking territorial continuities, fragmenting spaces, uh, saddling them with uh, various kinds of borders so as to better control movement and speed, accelerating it here, speed, uh, decelerating it there, and in the process, sorting, recategorizing, reclassifying people with the goal of better uh, selecting anew who is whom, who should be where, who shouldn't, all in the name of security. As a result, borders are no longer merely lines of demarcation separating distinct sovereign entities. Increasingly, they are the name used to describe the organized violence that underpins both contemporary capitalism and our world order uh, in general. The women, the men, the uh, unwanted children condemned to abandon or kept in cages, not only in the US, but also in other parts of the world, Europe included, the shipwrecks and drownings of hundreds almost monthly. In short, the image of uh, a humanity on the road to, to ruin. Whatever the case, the uh, technological transformation of borders uh, is in full swing. Physical and virtual barriers of separation, uh, digitalization of databases, filing systems, the development of new tracking devices, sensors, drones, satellites, sentinel robots, infrared detectors, various other cameras, biometric controls, new microchips containing personal details, everything is put in place to transform the very nature of the border, to turn the border, in fact, into a mobile, a portable, and omnipresent, ubiquitous reality. And I'm not exaggerating any of this. In fact, I'm not telling you all, all that's going on. All that is going on is far bigger than the quick details I have shared with you. Furthermore, everything is done to turn the skin itself into a border. Race playing here a crucial role. Indeed, as we speak, 100 years after the First World War, the signs of cultural pessimism can be seen once again all over Europe's war. I mentioned Europe in particular since we are here in Europe. I mean, we might be at the southern extremities of, of Europe, but we, we are right here in Europe, and uh, that's why I uh, refer to, to Europe. The old myth about the absolute superiority of so-called Western culture, understood as the culture of a race, the white race, is reactivated. Here in Europe, it is reactivated in America, it is reactivated in Australia, uh, and uh, elsewhere. Its supposed essence, the supposed essence of that uh, culture of the white race, the Faustian spirit recognizable by its technological power, this supposed essence is once again the object of uh, uh, overt uh, celebrations. 
Western culture, so it is claimed once again, is not an ordinary component of the culture of humanity, cultures of humanity. It enjoys, we are told, a preeminent status that grants it an immunity as a consequence of which the world's other cultures exist only through and in relation to it. These are things we thought we had overcome. They are coming back uh, with vengeance. And it would be a bit uh, disingenuous uh, to, to not take notice. Now, I have given you enough reasons uh, why it seems to me that uh, these times of ours are both times of planetary entanglement and uh, times of contraction, containment, uh, and now I forget the third uh, element, but I'm sure you, you have it. This having been said, let me move on. And uh, suggest that in fact, what is going on? I gave you all these examples, but what they signal is the fact that a new redistribution of the Earth with capital E is actually what is at stake. When we say migration crisis, when we say refugee crisis, or when we use a more encompassing term, human mobility, what we are talking about, what is at stake behind all these terms, is a new redistribution of the earth. A new redistribution of the earth premised on the capacity to move. And when I say new redistribution of the earth, I also mean a reallocation of its resources. I also mean uh, that what is at stake is the capacity of the human race, to use such a loaded term, to share the planet. So, what we are seeing through some of the anti-migration migration policies popping up, not only in Europe, but elsewhere. Uh, I mean, I'll give you the example of Angola. Angola is not in Europe. Uh, last week, the government of Angola expelled 200,000 uh, Congolese citizens. Uh, so it's not, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, uh, I'm not saying that this is an entirely European problem, I'm saying it's a planetary uh, problem, having to do with uh, our capacity to share the Earth, the planet or not, at a time precisely when sharing it is a precondition for its durability and is a precondition for uh, uh, our own sustainability. Now, what, part of what is going on then, part of what we are witnessing uh, in the anti-migratory policies uh, devised uh, throughout the world today, is uh, in fact, I would call it a bifurcation between life on the one hand and bodies on the other. In the sense that we are entering a renewed cycle uh, in which not every body, in both senses of the term, every body and every single body taken separately, not everybody is taken to contain life that is insured and protected. That what we are witnessing is a division, a separation between those lives that 
are insured against all kinds of risks and those which because they are not insured can be either abandoned or disposed of without anyone having to account for, for it. So for instance, there are 34,000 people who have died uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean. There's not one single entity that has been called to account for it. Neither the place they were trying to reach, nor the authorities of the state where they come from. Nobody. Some bodies are taken to contain no life as such. And the definition of life as such has changed tremendously. And as I was uh, suggesting, uh, some contain the kind of life that is not insured. And when I talk about insurance, I mean it both in the uh, speculative terms of contemporary capital, that life has become an object of speculation, which means um, a source of investment in profit-making operations, but I also mean in insured insurance uh, in the sense of uh, a life that uh, were it to disappear, um, some account would have to be uh, uh, asked for its loss. Um, a life that would be guaranteed by uh, a nation state. Um, for some of us, I mean, we can disappear to tomorrow. There's nobody, no entity that would come and ask where is he or she, what happened. Um, this disentanglement of life from certain categories of, of bodies, this uh, uh, this entanglement is a key dimension of contemporary migration regimes. And those lives that are considered uninsured uh, must be tracked, captured, sorted, recorded more and more by digital machines. Uh, whatever life they harbor must be turned into data. Thus, the development of all kinds of uh, machines and devices that allow for an immediate and mediated calculation of life, of movement, and more and more of race. In the sense that all of this is not only gendered, but it's also racialized. Within this new regime of capture, the life, the bodies, and movements of black people occupy a symptomatic place. The kind of symptomatic place, in fact, they have always occupied under capitalism, since the times of slavery. Under capitalism, indeed, these bodies have often been the first to be captured. Nowadays, this is done by motion tracking and sensing techniques or technologies in contexts and situations that, to be sure, are different from those of slave body measurements, but uh, in uh, conditions in which things like facial recognition uh, race profiling, criminal justice, uh, even uh, the uh, manufacturing of algorithms, all of this uh, is not neutral from the point of view of uh, racial biopolitics. Okay, I think I have been clear about, clear enough about that. Now, that things are fast reaching this point is because a new global security regime is in the making. 
It is a regime that is characterized by the uh, externalization, the militarization, and the miniaturization of borders. That's the first characteristic of this new global mobility regime. It is also a mobility regime that is defined by an endless fragmentation and contraction of rights and, as I uh, mentioned early on, an extension of tracking and surveillance as the privileged mode of mitigating risks. Its key function is to enhance mobility for some while impeding it or denying it to others. It has paved the way, this new global mobility regime, for unprecedented forms of racial violence, most of which target minorities, the disenfranchised, and already vulnerable people. And this violence is abetted by new logics of containment and incarceration. There have never been as many people in prisons as they are today, just from a purely statistical point of view. In the United States of America, there are more black people in jail than at any time in the history of the US. Um, expulsions are on the high, deportations too. Europe itself, uh, a few years ago, uh, counted hundreds of camps. Encampment is back. We thought it disappeared after the Holocaust. That is not true. Um, all the non-governmental organizations working on this issue of migration have mapped uh, the camps in Europe today and they keep increasing every single year. Furthermore, mobility is increasingly defined in geopolitical, military and security terms. In theory, those who present the lowest risk profile can move. In practice, the calculation of risk mostly serves to justify an equal and discriminatory treatment along the color line. So, that is uh, the uh, overall picture, if you want. Let me just add, before I move on to the second uh, part of the, this uh, brief presentation, let me just mention that in this new regime of global uh, movement, Africa is doubly penalized. It is penalized from the outside and from the inside. Today, there is hardly any country in the world that does not consider migrants from Africa undesirable. I'm now used to saying, just imagine, I don't know of any place on earth where a few, let's say a dozen, uh, 20 whatever African migrants arrive and they are welcomed. They are welcomed nowhere. At the same time, saddled with hundreds of internal borders, which make the cost of mobility highly prohibitive, Africa is trapped in a slow track lane and increasingly resembles a massive open air prison. It happens that uh, this afternoon, uh, this evening in fact, I was reading uh, Liz's news and there was this statement made by uh, probably the wealthiest man in the continent who happens to be a Nigerian. He owns uh, 
stuff almost everywhere. And he was complaining about the fact of having kept his Nigerian passport. And he was saying that within the continent itself, every time he has to, to move out of Nigeria, let's say he needs 33 visas to be able to move throughout uh, the continent. Um, so, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, this is, in any case, not it seems to me, this is, this is probably uh, one of the key issues uh, the continent will have to deal with. And now, I would like to move to the second part of the presentation and uh, develop a few ideas about how it is that using Africa as a paradigm, we might uh, come up with ideas concerning uh, the uh, government of human mobility, ideas that are uh, not at all premised on uh, the kinds of concepts we hear about here and there uh, in, in, in Europe. Let me, uh, before I move into that uh, propositional uh, part of the presentation, just tell you a little bit about why is it that the question of mobility is so central to Africa or to African or people of African descent in the world. In fact, at a deep historical level, African and diasporic struggles for freedom and self-determination have always been intertwined with the aspiration to move and change. In fact, whenever Africans or people of African descent have uh, been called upon to move in modernity, it has, for the most part, always been uh, and freely. I do not need to recall here the millions who left in chains to go and repeople uh, the new world. So whether under conditions of slavery, Atlantic slavery or the Trans-Saharan uh, slavery, or under colonial rule, the loss of our sovereignty automatically resulted in the loss of our right to free movement. So the question of free movement is at the heart, the political, philosophical, moral heart of our idea of self-determination, of our idea of autonomy, of our idea of freedom. I mentioned colonialism, I could have mentioned the apartheid regime uh, in which until pretty recently, the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, the past system uh, was uh, the mechanics through which black people mobility in their own land uh, was uh, 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 restrained. So this is the reason why the dream of a free, redeemed African nation was inextricably linked to the recovery of the right to come and go without let or hindrance across this colossal continent. The continent is absolutely colossal. I'll give you one example. You catch a flight in Cape Town down south, and you go into Casablanca. You will spend almost the entire day in the plane, non-stop, 12 hours. You move, you fly from Dakar on the western coast to Djibouti uh, on the, uh, near the Red Sea. You spend at least nine and a half hours trying to cross the continent. So it's a colossal continent. There is objectively 
not one single reason why any African person should be risking his or her life trying to cross the Mediterranean to reach a place where nobody is expecting him or her and where nobody wants to see him or her. There is none. But this is going on because the continent is saddled by hundreds and thousands of internal borders, most of which, if not all of which, are the product of colonial invention, pure and simple. So, if you want, the case is very clear. If Europe doesn't want illegal African migrants at home here, then Europe should support the struggle to open the continent to itself. And it can be done. It means that Europe has to turn its back to the kind of policies it decided, in fact, here in Valletta, not so long ago, when it decided to give the continent, I think, a bit less than one billion euros. They gave Turkey four billion and gave Africa one billion to some of our worst desperates, encouraging them to act as uh, uh, the enforcers of uh, an anti-migration policy that is, strictly speaking, inhuman. Or in any case, that is causing uh, the price uh, for, for its uh, operationality is increasing uh, as we speak. So, our history in modernity has been, to a large extent, one of constant displacement and confinement, forced migration and coerced labor. Think of the plantation system in the Americas and the Caribbean. Think of the black codes, uh, the pig laws, the vagrancy statutes after uh, the failure of uh, the reconstruction in the United States in 1877. Uh, think of the, uh, the chain gangs uh, laboring at tasks such as road construction, ditch digging, farming, and so forth and so on. Think too of the uh, so-called uh, code de l'indigena in French colonial Africa, uh, of the Bantustan and labor reserves in southern Africa, or, as I said early on, of the carceral industrial complex in today's America. In each of these instances, and I save you from many others, to be African and to be black has meant to be consigned to one or the other of the many uh, spaces of confinement uh, modernity invented. So that's enough uh, to convince anyone of the importance, at least for us, of imagining, if not a world uh, without borders, at least a borderless Africa. So now I'll tell you a few things about the struggles that are going on in the continent right now to open Africa to herself and to turn her into a vast space of circulation. I'll share with you some of the philosophical underpinnings of this struggle, which is a fundamental struggle to a lot of us. Um, that has to lead to a radical decolonization of the continent. The continent won't be totally decolonized as long as uh, it is uh, not open to every uh, and each African, as long as uh, we haven't achieved a position where no African is a stranger in Africa. So, where do we go looking for new concepts, notions, categories to imagine a world that would be 
opened, inhabited by all, shared by all, as a precondition for its durability and the durability of the human race. We first go and look into our own archives. Now, when we look into those archives, these are some of the things we find. We find, for instance, that in pre-colonial Africa, borders where they existed were always porous and permeable. That the function of the border was to facilitate relations. Where a border existed, it acted, it was deployed as a device to intensify exchanges, which is very different from the concept of borders inherited, let's say, from uh, Roman law, uh, uh, so to say. As evidenced by traditions of long distance trade, circulation was fundamental in the production of social forms. You see, we have a, there's a distinction between those cultures, historical formations, which believe that uh, space produces movement. Such is the case in, in the West. In the West, the understanding is that it is space which produces movement. In pre-colonial Africa, it was totally the reverse. It's movement which creates space. Movement comes before space. There's no space that is not the product of the ways in which people move, people, goods, ideas, religions, forms of marriage, everything. Space is a chain of flows, if you want. And uh, space is structured by networks of networks. So, family networks, trade networks, religious networks, a territory is nothing but a concatenation of networks. Networks, the uh, property of which is to release the flows of movement, the flows of circulation. This is something almost metaphysical. And one can explain it sociologically and historically. Because the economy was colossal and with the human function introduced through the centuries of slavery, slave trade, which means the predation of the strongest, the youngest bodies, the export abroad, there was a disequilibrium between territories and population rates, which had plenty of consequences, for instance, in terms of the capacity of the rulers to exploit their subjects. Because, let's say, you are my ruler, I'm a member of your polity, you want to extract surplus labor from me, I can just decide, okay, thank you very much, I moved, settled somewhere else. So, the capacity to move and settle somewhere else, indeed, was uh, intensified through the calculus of all these uh, factors. So the most important vehicle for transformation and change was mobility. And mobility was the driving principle behind the delimitation and organization of space and territories. I already mentioned networks, flows, crossroads as the most important, uh, let's say, indices of uh, uh, spatial organization and 
the regulation of, of movement. So what mattered the most was the extent to which flows intersected with other flows. I could go on and tell you about the extent to which state form, which is so fetishized today, a fetishization of uh, the nation state, how state form was but one of the myriad forms the government of people took. I could tell you about the extent to which peoplehood included not only the living, but also the dead, the unborn, humans, non-humans, in a, 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 a manner that uh, helps to imagine what uh, a democratic polity uh, might be, especially in the times of the Anthropocene. But uh, I won't go there, I can come back to this uh, in the discussion. It seems to me that as the uh, uh, global debate on human mobility in this age of planetary entanglement is unfolding, it might be helpful to all of us uh, to reopen uh, the archives of humanity at large and uh, try to find uh, models of territoriality uh, that are uh, less state-centric, uh, that uh, 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 opens the, the way to imagine uh, a different kind of, uh, of world. Let me end this then by uh, uh, saying one or two words about how, in fact, the new technological era we live in might help indeed in opening uh, the continent to itself and in moving uh, beyond uh, concepts of risk, enmity, uh, national interest that uh, have allowed for uh, the uh, uh, design of uh, uh, migration policies I personally consider uh, anti-human. So, uh, for instance, uh, technology could be used to facilitate cross-border trade, uh, could be used to harness uh, possibilities, opportunities of regional markets in the continent, to lower costs of payments, money transfers, facilitating cross-border mobile banking, for instance, making transport work, um, biometric identification, and interlinked databases uh, might be unavoidable if indeed we want to be able to, to share uh, our databases, to use identification procedures uh, and security technologies to generate uh, greater mobility on the continent. Um, we can pick up on all of that during the discussion. I will just end with um, one thing. Uh, I'm one of those who are actively committed to the idea of a borderless Africa. I believe that, uh, I believe in the project of an African nationality uh, that could be articulated in line with what the best of our thinkers in the continent diaspora uh, 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 spoke about uh, in the 19th century. It's a project which would include the possibility for people of African descent scattered throughout the world to return and resettle in Africa, if so they wish. Uh, it's also a project that would be opened to uh, new waves of immigration in the continent uh, so I believe that as Europe is closing its borders, uh, the best thing we can do is to open our doors to all uh, who would like to share their fate with ours. Thank you very much.